This video deals with delicate topics like the existence of allegedly imaginary characters and allegedly real countries. It has been certified safe to watch by children of all ages. Welcome to a special festive episode of Geographics. In today's exploration, we're going to visit the location that can officially boast the title of Home of Santa Claus or the HQ of Father Christmas. And no, I'm not talking about the North Pole. It would make very little sense for the Father of Christmas to set up his base there. Are we talking about the Magnetic North Pole or the Geographic North Pole? It's too vague of a location, which could cause a logistics nightmare any time a hopeful child attempts to write a Christmas letter. No, I'm talking about the official home of the big man in red and everything Christmassy, the Finnish town of Ravaniemi. Rovaniemi is the capital of Lapland in northern Finland, and it is placed just a smidge over the line of the Arctic Polar Circle. Unsurprisingly, the climate is positively freezing during the winter months. The average temperature recorded in February 2018 was 13 degrees below zero. In Fahrenheit world, this is more or less like Alaska. Rovaniemi has a relatively small population of 62,420 inhabitants, yet the community still encompasses 90 different nationalities according to the town's tourism board. It is not clear if these figures also include inhabitants with antlers or pointy ears. Either way, this population is spread over a surface area of 8,016 square kilometers or 3,100 square miles. By comparison, London occupies an area of 1,572 square kilometers or 600 107 square miles. You could fit all of Rovaniemi's population into London's Olympic Stadium, and yet its surface area is five times that of the English capital. Technically, this makes Rovaniemi the largest city in Europe. Some basic arithmetic tells us that the average population density is only seven inhabitants per square kilometer. Inhabitants here may feel pretty lonely. Alternatively, they may also enjoy plenty of free space to breathe. I guess it all depends on whether you enjoy human contact or not. But even committed hermits may feel the need for human contact during the winter months, and at this latitude throughout the winter, most of the hours in the day are claimed by darkness. On the shortest day of last year, December the 21st, the recorded duration of daylight in Rovaniemi was only 2 hours, 14 minutes, 38 seconds. I don't know what's worse, having to cope with 22 hours of darkness or facing the period from June the 7th through July 5th, 2020, in which the sun will be up for 28 straight days. It will start setting down again on the 6th and stay down for a full 30 minutes of night. I realize all of this is pretty standard for our friends who live around those latitudes, but for us southerners, it's pretty mind-boggling. So for those of you who do not cope well with extremes of light or darkness, I would recommend visiting Rovaniemi during spring and autumn when daytime and nighttime appear to be relatively normal. Coincidentally, these are also the best seasons to admire the northern lights, according to local photographer Alex Kuznetsov. The northern lights are caused by the interaction of the solar wind, a stream of charged particles escaping the sun, and our planet's magnetic fields and atmosphere. As the solar wind approaches, it distorts the Earth's magnetic field and allows charged particles from the sun to enter the Earth's atmosphere at the magnetic north poles. Then, as these charged particles excite gases in our atmosphere, they make them glow in a spectacular display. Kuznetsov's recommended spots to photograph the northern lights in Rovaniemi are the Arctic Garden, the Science Center, and the Museum Arcticum, which hosts exhibitions about the culture of Lapland and life in the Arctic. These are only some of the many attractions offered in Rovaniemi, which contributes to its tourist appeal. Even in photographs, Rovaniemi stands out as a pleasant, tidy, happy city, even if it were not blessed by the presence of a certain Mr. Christmas. And yet, the history of the capital of Lapland is darker than one may expect. So we're going to begin our story of Rovaniemi in the 1930s, when it was a quiet trading town of about 6,000 people. After the Finns fought the Soviets in the Winter War from 1939 to 1940, they formed a protective alliance with Germany, an insurance policy against further incursions from Joseph Stalin. Finland never became a formal member of the Axis powers, but they were referred to as a co-belligerent country. The Wehrmacht created a base in Rovaniemi, and the garrison doubled the town's population. They built an airfield and some barracks on a site that would later become known as Santa Claus Village, but let's not jump ahead just yet. 
At the onset of Operation Barbarossa in June of 1941, the Finnish army, under Field Marshal Carl Gustav Emil Mannerheim, joined its Axis friends in an invasion of the Soviet Union. The goal of the Finns was simply to recapture the territories lost to the Soviets a year earlier in the Winter War, and their campaign became known as the Continuation War. When the Red Army's counterattack pushed the Axis into a retreat, the Finns were pressured by Stalin to expel the Germans from their country. The Germans evacuated Rovaniemi in October of 1944, employing scorched earth tactics to burn everything to the ground. About 90% of the town's structures were destroyed. Pieces of burnt wood and metal can still be found in Rovaniemi's gardens. At the time of destruction, most of the residents had already relocated, many of them to Sweden, but 279 died in the process. A further 200 inhabitants died on their return, killed by landmines left by the German army. Nearly 10% of the original population of Rovaniemi had perished as a result of the operation. After VE Day, the Helsinki government began organizing the reconstruction of Rovaniemi, and the Association of Finnish Architects handed over the task to one of its more prominent members, Alvar Aalto. Born in 1898, Alto graduated as an architect in 1921. His work initially followed the style of Nordic classicism, then modernism, before settling on a functionalist phase. As you might expect, functionalism adopted the principles of user-friendliness and functionality as key priorities, which Alto enriched through the use of organic forms and natural materials. His signature style was to treat each building as a complete work of art, from its load-bearing walls all the way down to the furniture and the light fittings. When Alto was greeted by the desolate wasteland that was Ravaniemi, he saw it not as a challenge, but as an opportunity to create an ideal modern town in the wake of Nazi destruction. Alto's idea was to rebuild the city with affordable houses specifically designed for the Arctic climate. They were, and still are, very spacious, allowing families to live comfortably indoors during the long, cold, and dark winter months. At the same time, they were designed for maximum energy efficiency. Each structure had as little north-facing facade as possible and maximum external exposure to the sun in the southwest. This would allow them to save on heating and electricity consumption. Next, Alto had to conceive the new street plan for the city. He paid homage to Lapland's most iconic animal by designing a reindeer antler street grid. He simply imposed the outline of the head of a reindeer on existing topography. Coincidentally, it matched the natural shape of the territory. In a brilliant touch, the football stadium became an eye and the reindeer head of Rovaniemi was born. Alto's ultimate plan was to divide the reindeer into three different functional areas, one for commerce, one for residential buildings, and one for administrative offices. But this design was never fully realized. He did design three buildings for the administrative areas, which are considered some of his finest works, an undulating concert hall, a town hall, and a library. In 1950, the architect expanded his plans to the rest of the Lapland region, an area the size of Holland and Belgium combined. Still concerned with efficient energy, Alto plans for the construction of several hydroelectric plants, ensuring first that they would not have a negative impact on the environments, on the indigenous Sami people, on the reindeer herding communities, nor on the microclimate. Throughout all of this elaborate planning, Alto had to operate on a shoestring budget. While the rest of war-torn Europe could count on financial aid from the Americans' Marshall Plan, Finland had been forced to reject Uncle Sam's aid because of Soviet pressure. The only relief came from some financial support provided by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration at the insistence of its patron, Eleanor Roosevelt. In June 1950, Roosevelt decided to pay a visit to Lapland as she wished to visit the Arctic Circle. The Welcome Committee had a log cabin built near Rovaniemi Airport on the site where the German barracks used to be. The cabin subsequently became a tourist attraction, visited by 20th century world leaders like Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev and Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. Alvar Aalto died in 1976, so he never witnessed the full expansion of his city in the early 1980s. In the decade following Aalto's death, tourism in Rovaniemi finally exploded, thanks in part to adventurous visitors who wanted to visit the Arctic Circle. By 1984, incoming tourism was so regular that a Concord service was set up to allow tourists to zoom straight into Rovaniemi's small airport. It was around this time that Eleanor Roosevelt's cabin was expanded with additional facilities, a few shops, a picturesque post office, and a station for reindeer rides. This became the foundation for Santa Claus Village.
Now let's be clear about this. Despite claims to the contrary from the Rovaniemi Tourism Board, Santa Claus Village is not where Father Christmas actually lives and works. I'm sorry to break such disappointing news to you all. The village is simply a theme park where Father Christmas and his associates do show up to entertain guests, raise funds, and occasionally recruit new helpers. The real location of Santa's base of operations, well, that's still a closely guarded secret. Many believe Santa's lair to be Corvatanturi, or Ear Mountain, a rock formation shaped like an ear. According to legend, it is through this ear that Father Christmas can hear the wishes of every child in the world. Corvatanturi is a 258-mile drive, that's 415 kilometers, to the north of Rovaniemi, and it is located on the Russian border. A trek to Corvatanturi may present some difficulties, especially if you're traveling with children, but we do recommend you at least pay a visit to the Santa Claus Village. Here, you can cross the magical Arctic Circle. You can meet Father Christmas in his chamber every day of the year, where, alongside his elves, he's happy to meet new visitors and their four-legged friends. The elves will also be on hand at the local post office, which is where Father Christmas receives letters from all around the world. Skeptics may point out that that giant ear at Corvatanturi should be enough to convey the wishes of the children, so why rely on letters? While well, skeptics should open their own giant ears and pay attention, as I've already mentioned Corvatanturi sits on the russian finnish border, meaning military-grade communications equipment and air control surveillance may have been jamming incoming wishes since the height of the Cold War. If the air around the Arctic Circle is a bit too chilly for you, then how about you go underground? You can visit Santa Park, an indoor expansion of the theme park located in a former underground nuclear shelter. By entering Santa Park, you can access plenty more activities, an elf workshop, a magic train, an ice gallery, and an ice bar. But the standout feature is elf school. After a brief course on toy making, aspiring winter helpers can receive an elf diploma to take home. Some believe this to be some sort of underhanded scheme to identify promising candidates for permanent elf positions, but we've got more on that later on. If you feel like stepping outdoors again, your next stop is Juluka, the secret forest. Here you can participate in more Christmas crafts and toy making with the help of the elves. If you're lucky, you will get a glimpse of the Northern Lights. And if you're really lucky, elves will take you to Santa's replica Christmas Command Center, which may be a sign that you could be considered for a regular elf job. From inside the secret forest, you'll be able to access the Snow Hotel, which is, well, a hotel made of snow. This may not be to everyone's tastes, as even the Rabani Emmy Tourism Office admits. It states, It is true that not everyone wants to stay overnight in the Snow Hotel, but the venue is a sight in itself. I also feel we should point out at this point that this video is not sponsored by the Tourism Board or any of the attractions that we have mentioned. I hope you'll agree with me that during this holiest of seasons, all you really want to do is smell ginger and cinnamon rather than the stench of skeptic conspiracies. But allow me to delve into them right now so that I might deconstruct them one at a time like blocks in a rickety rhetorical Jenga tower. Conspiracy theories regarding Santa and Ravaniemi can be broadly divided into two categories. Theories that create an alleged truth that is not immediately visible, and theories that deny the existence of obvious truths which are clearly visible. Historiography and propaganda have always regaled us with scores of conspiracy theorists who have denied major historical events. A powerful clique of authors, reporters, and broadcasters have been denying the existence of Father Christmas for generations now, a claim that just flies in the face of logic. These Christmas deniers, desperate to come up with yet another outrageous claim, have recently adopted a blanket approach beyond simply denying the existence of Father Christmas. They could have denied the existence of his operations in Ravaniemi and Zadir Mountain, but no, they just had to go and deny the existence of the entire country of Finland. That's right, according to these crafty concocters of conniving conspiracists, the landmass known as Finland is actually occupied by the Baltic Sea. At the end of World War II, a secret Soviet-Japanese treaty allowed for Japanese fishing boats to plunder unlimited catch in these waters. The fish would be allowed to travel back to Japan via the Trans-Siberian Railway, and Soviet authorities would get a cut of the catch in exchange for free passage. These Finland truthers claim that Finland was invented by government agents in Moscow and Tokyo in order to convince the world that this big Baltic Sea did not exist. 
Thus, this would allow for the Japanese trawlers to fish undisturbed. This, of course, led to a massive cover-up, which included the creation of a Finnish language and the falsification of maps and satellite pictures. So, back in the present day, the Finland deniers are spreading their so-called truth, believing they can fool us into removing from our consciousness the existence of Father Christmas and the country that hosts him and his operations. If you want proof of the existence of Finland, I have a simple method. Just look at the Northern Lights photos of Alex Kuznetsov mentioned earlier. By looking at the angle and position of the stars in the background, it is easy to calculate the coordinates of the spot from whence he shot said pictures. And by looking at the terrain in the foreground, it is evident the photographer was not standing on a barge in the Baltic Sea. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's address the elephant in the room, and I hope he understands that this is not a reference to his size. I'm talking, of course, about Father Christmas, whose non-existence has been proven with ill-constructed logical arguments. Number 1. Immortality How can this person be alive after so many centuries, still distributing gifts? Well, first of all, immortality should not be discounted entirely. Turoptopsis dornil is a jellyfish that has been demonstrated to be virtually immortal. After completing the reproductive cycle, the jellyfish reverts to a juvenile state over and over again in a potentially eternal cycle. If Dorney is not physically harmed, it can live forever. But I understand that immortality is not to everyone's taste, so I'd rather focus on a theory put forward by anthropologist Serpa Lekonen. According to the good professor, historical records have confused our idea of Father Christmas. This name does not indicate a person. Rather, it is a title, a mantle, that is handed over from generation to generation. Notable and illustrious historical figures from the past and present have taken on this role, usually after retirement or presumed death. Normally, these honorees would be male, bearded, and sporting a belly that shakes like a pot full of jelly. Previous alleged Father Christmases include the advisor to Henry V, Sir John Falstaff, Italian Renaissance man Leonardo da Vinci, who may have contributed to the technology behind the sleigh, King Henry VIII, French writer Alexandre de Mar, the beard was grown later, American author Ernst Hemingway, and so on. Number 2. Elves I can understand the skepticism about thousands of elves working in a toy factory all year long. Elves are not, in fact, an autochthonous ethnicity to Finland, unlike trolls who clearly hail from Norway, where they lurk beneath bridges and in the comment section. But this can easily be explained. In 2016, the scandal known as the Panama Papers blew up on front pages all over the world. It was an unprecedented leak of files related to the legal and not quite legal financial transactions that were managed by an offshore law firm called Mossack von Seca. Among these files, several made a reference to an exclusive offer to invest in a Finnish pension fund identified as representatives and toy manufacturers, or in the local language, Edestayat ja leluyen valmistayat, or for short, ELV. I dare say the Finnish elves are the beneficiaries of such a fund, toy makers and other professionals employed by Father Christmas, and not just your traditional elves. It's a setup that surely favors diversity and meritocracy over the employment of a single ethnic group, regardless of how allegedly skilled they may be at toy making. And speaking of leaks, the Mitrican archives of secret KGB files published in 1999 revealed why Father Christmas dons a red outfit. It's not because of Coca-Cola's marketing strategy, but rather another pressure imposed by the Soviet Union on Finland at the onset of the Cold War. The Moscow Politburo insisted on a red coat to match their flags, and the tradition struck. All of this clearly makes perfect sense. Number 3. Nighttime Delivery this is my favorite one. Our friends, the skeptics, wonder how a single person can deliver hundreds of millions of gifts in a single night in only 12 hours of darkness. Well, my dear know-it-alls, first of all, it is not just in a single night. Orthodox communities celebrate Christmas on the 7th of January, while children in many Spanish-speaking countries receive their gifts on the 6th of January. Just like that, we've tripled the time available. Next, I mentioned the length of the nights around the Arctic Circle. Didn't I? It's about 22 hours, so by establishing his operations in the Arctic Circle, Father Christmas has made a perfect choice. From there, he has easy access to the Arctic Circle, and by flying along this parallel, the big man in red can gain 10 extra hours of darkness. And just like that, again, we've doubled the available time. Finally, Father Christmas can and does buy extra time by traveling against the rotation of the Earth, thus ensuring he spends as much time as possible within the dark side of the planet. Time doubled again. Checkmate, skeptics. But we'll end it there, as I don't want to fan the flames of controversy. I'd rather just fan the flames of my fireplace. And no, I'd rather not stir the animosity of trolls, and just rather stir the eggnog and spice. 
But I do hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope you thought it was a bit of fun and maybe you discovered a thing or two about possibly the most festive place on earth. Whether you are a skeptic or a believer, the story of the rebirth of Robin Yemi is undeniably inspiring. I'll take my leave today by wishing everybody a very Merry Christmas and as usual, thank you for watching. We'll be back real soon with something from our regular schedule.